I had a um, pageant director at age like 21, 22. He was like, when you get really animated, um, you get all these like, all these lines, you kind of look like a bulldog. So we're gonna have to get that fixed. So yeah, there's a lot of that. Let's welcome Hannah Brown to the Checkup Podcast. You may remember her from season 15 being the Bachelorette. In this podcast, we have a lot of conversation about her health. In fact, it's probably one of our most medical podcast conversations we've had to date. She also shares some really intimate stories about her mental health and some of the intense scrutiny and criticism she got as a pageant contestant. In fact, she actually said that the criticism she got during her pageant days was more rough than the treatment she got at the hands of U.S. Special Forces on the new Fox show, Special Forces. We talk all about that and more. Hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Let's get started with the Checkup Podcast. I know you're going to hate me right now, but um, Sam? Yes. Not oh. Sam. Oh. oh my gosh, Sarah. Sarah. Yes. I really need some, my lips are really uh, oh, no. parched. Okay. Could you, in my bag, or could you just bring my bag? Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. I've been talking all day long and I can imagine. probably not drinking enough water. So Gotta before we start, I don't want to. Like this is how I want to open it. I want to open it with you requesting moisturizer for your lips. Oh my gosh. Then I sound like a diva. <laughs> no, that's awesome. But I also, you know. It's relatable. It is. I mean, I don't want the, cru the crusty lips. Us regular lips. people get crusty lips too. I was talking to my uh, makeup artist this morning and I was like, Oh my gosh, don't put that on my lips. Like, look, I what's in my bag right now? And inhaler, I have asthma. We can talk oh, about that. Okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you carry it. Is it expired? Advil. Is it expired? No, because I was having, I can tell you about this. Uh -huh. I, had, <laughs> I had. Welcome to the checkup. Yeah. I had a whole stint of like, I couldn't breathe for two months recently. It was after, I don't know if I got COVID. It said I didn't have COVID. Hmm. Um, I had an asthma attack on the plane. That's not a good. Had place to, to get. Have it. Oh, it was it was really scary, and um, yeah, they had to like give me oxygen for like twenty minutes. It was wow. it was. Did you have your pump? Yeah, I ha no, I did. Did I have it? Yes, I did have it with mm -hmm. me, um, because it was. I was noticing I was having having a hard time. I kept coughing. It was like this cough. Um, that wouldn't go away. And I'm sure everyone around you remained really calm seeing you cough. Well, I say it, that sarcastically because everyone's afraid of people coughing these days. Exactly. I was like really um, embarrassed, but it happened. I don't know if you know why this happened, but as soon as we like got, it was like my ears popped. Mm -hmm. And when my ears popped, I coughed. I don't know. And then it triggered. Hmm. But it was like, that's all I remember is as we got into the air and like your ears, like, you know, when you get to a certain yeah. place, it, they popped, I coughed and then I could not get it under control. Whoa. It was crazy. And that's never happened before. No. Were you wheezing? I had been ca I constantly coughing for like, this was like two months. Mm. I was, I had to take my inhaler. I hadn't taken my inhaler in years. Mm -hmm. Last time I did when I was on the bachelorette, I had bronchitis that was the last time that I'd really had to use it. Was that because all the men took your breath away? I wish that was why. No, <laughs> I was just like. You said no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, but yeah, I hadn't had any problems with asthma in forever. And then mm -hmm. it all got triggered. And I used, like I almost used a whole thing of it. Thing of yeah, it. so I would um, venture my guess and I have to do the whole medical legal thing. Yeah. I'm not becoming your doctor. I'm not diagnosing you because there's obviously a lot that would have needed to take place for me to make a proper diagnosis. But I don't think it was asthma related <laughs> what was going on. You don't? Mm -mm. What do you think it was? I don't like the presentation and picture you paint is not an asthma attack picture. Just coughing? Because it, it was just a cough. Well, the symptom was coughing. I'm thinking about what the trigger or starting point is. Like, what's the cause of the cough? So I'm thinking past the cough. Well, the cough didn't start on the airplane. That was like... Ongoing. Ongoing for, like I said, two two months, basically. Yeah, like that doesn't make sense for me from an asthmatic picture. That it, so yeah. something else was going on. Either 
um, like, do you, again, I don't want to start diagnosing you on camera, but, uh, do you ever have issues with acid reflux? Okay. You can probably tell me. Yes. <laughs> Wait, why? Okay. This is something so weird. Actually, this can sound, I don't want it to sound, ugh, I'm already saying it. Don't Just say it. it. It's beautiful. I can't swallow. <laughs> Okay, finish that's, the sentence now. <laughs> that's what I said. I was like, it's going to sound weird. So when I like take a sip of water. Okay. There's a delay? I always, yeah. Mm. And then I watched your assumptions video and you do some kind of unique throat movement thing. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, what is that? Well, when my my ear, <laughs> my ears always feel like there's like water or something in them mm -hmm. and like pressure. So when that starts to get like really out of control, it like, it's like I, the only way I can like itch it. Mm -hmm. And so I just like. With your finger. I go, I'll, I'll just like open it up. Uh -huh. and just go. What's the, what's the like, additional sound do? Like, are, are you scratching it with here? No, I feel like I'm like. Getting, vibrating it. Yes. So I feel like you have a very unified airway more so than most. What is that? You so just like, have you heard of the eustachian tube? Mm -mm. Okay, so there's a tube that connects your sinuses to your ear that acts as a pressure release valve. But this is a that's the thing that pops when you're on an airplane going up and down okay. because it's trying to equalize the pressure. When it opens, it pops, and all of a sudden you have equalization. If not, your ear hurts a lot when going up and down, or your sinuses hurt mm -hmm. real bad. So if for whatever reason that eustachian tube is inflamed, allergies, viral infection, bacterial infection, anatomical issue that tube gets closed, there's no good pressure equalization, you start either getting sinus pressure or ear congestion. And a lot of people have this eustachian tube dysfunction and it's because of something that's underlying that's being un under treated. So like the treatment needs to go not at the eustachian tube, but, but whatever's causing the eustachian tube to be inflamed. Okay, what are, what are some things that- Well, like I just said, the allergies is one, viral infection, bacterial infection, or post-viral. Mm. In, inflammation that happens on a lot especially post covid you start seeing a lot of like strong inflammatory response even though the virus is gone and that takes a little bit of time to clear you know my brother has really bad allergies acid reflux but i never really got tested for allergies when i was younger mm -hmm. I but like what about I symptomatically like do you get itchy watery eyes sneezy hives okay do you have eczema Yes. Okay. I'm going to, sorry. I'm like, this is great. Okay. This is my mystery thing. Okay. Oh, there's so many, like there's so many things that are interesting. Um, uh, my legs break out or like get these red splotch. Okay. If it's like really cold outside or if I go on a run mm -hmm. and I know people like, you know, when the circulation's going, but mine's like different. It like, itches like internally not like my skin like mm -hmm. inside it itches so bad to like the point like i'm, a, I'm like pretty tough mm -hmm. but like to the point like i can't run anymore like it hurts so bad sometimes just going on a walk um and you'll see it like i have like like kind of like these weird like red spots all over my legs mm -hmm. um and i don't know what it is and then it'll slowly go away as you warm up as I warm back up, mm -hmm. I do have Renaud's. Could, Could be. that be it? Yeah. So basically, your body is having some sort of overreaction mm -hmm. to the cold. Because normally, what your body's supposed to do is it's supposed to shut off the blood vessels that bring blood flow to the, like your extremities, to your fingers, to your skin, because that's like an easy way for your body to lose heat. So, in order to prevent that heat loss, it redirects the blood to go to the internal organs by closing off those blood okay. vessels. If it overreacts to the cold, which is what happens in Raynaud's, it like makes things turn blue, different colors. Like people frequently had that in their hands when going outside. When I was on The Bachelor Bachelorette, I had so many people like constantly concerned about my hands because they would see that they were like purple at some points because um, we were in a lot of cold places. Mm. And it would be like, a, that. you know, my hand would be like by my face and it's like this drastic different color. They're like, I had so many like nurses like messaging me like, hey, I think like you have Renaud's, you should like get that checked out. <laughs> um, but I didn't know that the like running, I mean the itchiness like internal was. Um, it could be related to that, but then the, the allergic component 
could be that as well. And the reason I mentioned eczema, allergies, and asthma mm-hmm. is because that's a, a triangle thing of a triad that happens in people who have all three. Mm. That you're more likely to fall into that triad if you have one of those. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, we could talk about this all. Like, I also have like poor circulation, so I didn't know that maybe that was part of it. And I had, I just went to the doctor this past like two years ago. Like, I, my body like just shut down on me. Um, I remember I was like trying to walk upstairs and like my legs wouldn't work. It was wild. That's really scary. It was really scary. My um, neighbor at the time, like she was right there and she was like, let me take you to the emergency room. Like let's, I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Like it just like could not feel my legs. And I was having really bad ankle problems. Like it was hurting pretty bad and was seeing somebody for that. And then I looked down at my legs and the same thing they were like, purple whoa and like um weird spots and so i took a picture of them and like you could like just was not getting good circulation and i went to the emergency care and they were like i think you just have anxiety and i was like well i i do but i took a picture and i sent it to my physical therapist and was like no like you definitely like there's something going on Mm -hmm. and just my like calf was like so tight that like he, I mean, I don't know. Uh, like, he had to cut off like the blood supply. Like, it had gotten. I don't. That's what he thinks. And anyway, I had to like. It finally got better, but yeah, it was so weird. So that was like the first thing, and maybe it's anxiety manifesting in my body. Sorry, I'm like these are all the, the this is interesting the diagnosis I've given myself or other people have thought. And then I really was struggling with my mental health as well. Um, but it was like, my body was just like, kind of like my leg, my arms and legs would like tingle really bad. Um, like I went and then go like numb randomly. And then we've got a lot of like women stuff that's going on too. Sure. Sounds like it's a lot. It's a lot. And it's yeah. like frustrating. Cause I feel like everything's kind of, there has to be something. One of the things it's controlling all the other things, I feel like. Do you have a good primary care doctor? No. That would help a lot. I don't have a primary care doctor, and I haven't for like th- this whole time things were going on. But I'm moving to Nashville next month, and that is like number one on my list. Okay, I like it. I've gotten Priority all these specialists there. because all this happened like really cl- in during COVID, and the way that I got to the first doctor, it was just like, First doctor was like, oh, you just need to get your nose done. You can't breathe properly, mm. which I do have a deviated septum, but I don't know if that's like causing everything. I don't know. Maybe you can tell me. Um, <laughs> I think you're right to question the diagnosis. Di- yeah. Uh, so yeah, I've just been on a journey with doctors, but I also haven't got the primary care doctor. Yeah. I think you've gotten a lot of piecemeal diagnoses on like individual conditions which may or may not be happening. And at the same time, may or may not be responsible for all your symptoms. <laughs> so yeah. it's kind of like a, a partial look. And that's why a primary care doctor is so important that, for example, like could anxiety cause some of the physical manifestations of the things you just described? Very possible. Like it's mm-hmm. not an incorrect thing to have on your list of potential causes. But it really should be one that would be a diagnosis of exclusion meaning you need to exclude other things that you could potentially fix or could have ramifications if you don't fix before you jump to anxiety. So yes. I would do a little bit more of a, an investigation before just saying, yeah, it's anxiety, you're good. Because also you're not good because then the anxiety is still an issue causing these physical problems that should be addressed as well. For sure. Yeah. So it's been such a journey. I'm still trying to figure it out. I really haven't talked about some like some of this stuff ever, but I'm, I don't talk about it too much. I think this is a great place to, cause I, I feel like there is some missing link mm-hmm. that we're still trying to like figure out. Um, but I have been feeling a little bit better. I mean, that was a, a really hard time mm-hmm. for a while. Um, well, it sounded like you had a lot going on, not just from a physical perspective, but also mental health as well. Yes. And, but I've always been pretty active and not being able to like work out the way that I did that also was 
really hard. Mm -hmm. Um, but now like, obviously I did this show and that really showed me, I think that the show was so important for me for like my mental and physical health. Yeah. Let's set up the show for people. So it, it, yeah. Yeah, um, Tell me how you became a special forces superhero. I have no idea. (laughs) Um, yeah. So I did this experience in June of this past year and we're in the middle of the Jordanian desert and um, get put through a small taste of what our special forces kind of go through in their training. And it was one of the most difficult things I I've, I have done and hopefully will do. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, both physically and mentally. And when I got the call for it, I was a little, um, they're actually very apprehensive of doing it just because my team kind of knew I was like struggling and physically and healing mentally for sure. I was on the journey of that, but the physical stuff was still trying to like figure out and had just gotten back into working out. So I was just like, Oh, I'm a little nervous about doing this is, you know, um, but I talked to my therapist, my psychiatrist, my trainer, and they're like, no, I think you can do this. Like, mm. I think this this will actually be good for you. Because I'd kind of gotten into that, not victim mentality, but like, I thought I was I'm weak. fragile. Yeah. Yes, fragile. I just felt fragile. Like, anything I do could like, put, cause more damage while I'm still trying to figure out what's going on with mm-hmm. me. Um, but I ended up deciding that I thought it would be good for me to like, help build back my confidence or just kind of put to test what I've been working on, at least mentally. And it definitely did. Yeah. Um, It was actually like such a great experience for me. And it kind of got me out of that mindset that like, I can't do anything. Like I'll, I'll get hurt or start feeling worse um, when you're put in those type of situations. What did you feel happen after those situations where you had to test yourself? Um, I mean, a sense of like, not even like sometimes like, I was just really like zoned in the whole time, um, which I also like wor- talked to my psychiatrist about of like, I think when you have um, a little bit of like PTSD from different, like the way that I was just my background, um, I really handled the situation in a way that was kind of unlike some of the other people on the show of, I was really locked in and my body felt like, oh, I've been here before. Mm. So for me, I wouldn't, I could have, like, I felt like I could have stayed like days longer. Wow. Um, But like, I knew that was kind of like, not that it's unhealthy, but I, I knew that there was something different going on inside my head versus like other people. Um, But I was like, huh, why is this not affecting me the same way? Why am I not like super emotional? I'm just like really like. Zoned in. Zoned in. Did you feel dissociated from the moment? 1,000%. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like I got back and I was like, hmm, uh, I do this. But I, I know that I also, now that I've gone to therapy, like realized that I kind of do that in certain situations. So um, it was really eye-opening and it's something now that I can now can work on and like understand a yeah. little bit. Uh, but it helped me get through the course, I guess. <laughs> well, that's why for better or for worse. it's it's true coping mechanism. And when you're doing that in your everyday life and you're disconnecting from your emotions, you're not just disconnecting from the negative ones. You're also disconnecting from the good ones. Because mm-hmm. if you want to tone down the negativity in your life by toning down your emotions, you're also toning down your positivity at the same time. One lever controls both. Yes. But in a situation where you're trying to survive in the water, handcuffed in a car or what have you, maybe it's okay to dissociate in a moment like yeah, that. Yeah, I I do think I didn't have these crazy up and downs. I just kind of was like even kill the whole time. Mm-hmm. I didn't let like a victory like make me like, oh my God. Yeah. But I also didn't make like a failure or something really crazy happening like affect me either. So it worked for this. Now, in regular life, it's something that from that experience it opened my eyes up mm. to, huh, do I do this in other situations? That's great. And it's great. I've now started like EMDR therapy. Mm-hmm. And I think that's been a really a good tool for me right now. I say tool weird because I say like, I don't know. I'm sorry. You, sound, you said it normally. 
Okay. Sometimes I think it's like Southern the way I say it, but maybe. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So I've been doing that and it's kind of helped me with like connecting, learning how to connect with my body and emotions and stuff. Mm-hmm. So that's been, I think. I, I think that's really powerful. Do you think that's your superpower? Why you stay winning in reality TV shows? Is be dissociating? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's like, honestly, you, yes. You can't stop winning. No, I, I truly think that's why. Interesting. And if people ask who were on the show with me and Dancing with the Stars, they say the same. I'm like so locked in. I don't, I was a little bit more, emo, like I was emotionally like unwell that whole time. Mm-hmm. I just gone through like crazy time. I mean, I was on TV, on ABC, like for a whole year, like yeah. every Monday. During a time where people are watching. Yes. And I'm like, I'm coming from Tuscaloosa, Alabama to Los Angeles and like, it was just a, a complete juxtaposition, uh, no prep. It just kind of happened. There was no warm up. You didn't stretch before. No, you're just like, all right. I'm like, what? Go are- to the slam dunk contest. Yes. So, um, what's that like? Like, that's got to be overwhelming. It was. I mean, I literally have been processing it for the past like two years. That's like on the healing journey because like it's so wonderful in one breath and then. I think we also are seeing it a lot and like um like now how TikTok is and like so the and the young people like when they're just like these normal people like doing their stuff on TikTok and then you blow up. Stop it's saying like, young people like you're not part of young people. <laughs> I know, but I feel like I've grown up in the past four years. Like at twenty four, I'm like, Oh, baby Hannah, like was or twenty three when I did all this mm-hmm. stuff and now I'm like Oh gosh, now now we actually know what's <laughs> happening a little. Okay. Um and but, you'll say the same thing in four years. For know, sure. Right? Okay. For yeah. sure. But it's just a lot to to handle. And you don't I didn't know anybody that could really like help me during that time. And then you like take a step back and you're like, whoa, what just happened? So yeah, it was really tough. Who was your person during that time? Um, well, because I dissociate and isolate no one. Oh no, that's not healthy. No, it was not. I, I really isolate and like, didn't know how to figure out what was going so on. So you just sold Until I hit on. like rock bottom and then it was like, um, mm. okay, we need to like, we need to try focus. some therapy yeah. and figure out how to like, what, what keeps, what's the story that I keep going on in my head and if you could talk to yourself in that moment would you have encouraged yourself to seek therapy before all of this happened before rock bottom 1000 percent. why uh because i think that's that was a lot that i was going through like i feel like you know you see your you know i'm not even that i was not not that long ago but like your younger self and you're like dang like you kind of grieve for the moments where you don't reach out or the moments that you, you don't have somebody to really confide in and understand. And so, or just kind of give you that, that place, um, just be like a safe place that really has no skin in the game at all. And just, An just listening. Voice. Yeah. Objective voice. Yeah. I totally wish I would have done that. Um, and definitely needed it. Um, even before. That's yeah. why I made great TV. <laughs> uh, so yes, that was, and and but now like found it and I'm like so grateful for it. I think everybody should do therapy. Yeah, I think what's, what's powerful about therapy and kind of a misunderstanding that so many people have is they think it's just talking about your feelings, but there's the objective voice that carries a huge benefit. It's someone that's not having the same emotions you are that can allow you to bounce ideas off them. And then number two, the big one is you learn tools, your favorite word, yes, of how to manage in certain situations, not necessarily life advice, but your own methods, whether or not they're helpful, in what ways they're not helpful. Because a lot of people like to say something is all good or all bad, like disconnecting is bad, this is good. It's not that simple. It depends where and it depends your personality type. And especially in a situation where you found yourself, which is the most unnatural of all scenarios. Mm-hmm. No human 50 years ago, maybe we can rewind even further, 100 years ago, would find themselves in a situation with millions of people judging their actions. Yes. That just didn't exist. Mm -hmm. In the moment, especially, with immediate feedback. 
Yes. Like movie stars in the 60s might get a letter of something that people didn't like about them, but you're getting bombarded with it on social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, especially uh, like some of the reality shows like have like this, you know, like huge following and it can be like really cruel. Like Bachelor Nation is, is great in some sense, but it's also has this like dark side of people just don't forget that you're a human being and um, it's kind of known for that mm -hmm. in, in a way. And so, Isn't the pageant world quite similar to that? Yes, I will say uh, <laughs> the Special Forces show, we we get interrogated. Yeah. It's actually like tonight. I don't know when this airs, it, but. Yeah, it will um, be tonight. And I was talking to my mom after and I was like, they're really tough and scary, but honestly, I think a mean pageant girl would be worse. <laughs> Truly, like pretty mean pageant girls are my worst I hope you didn't nightmare. say that to the special forces people. That no, would, I wouldn't. Because that wouldn't have boded well. No, for you. but it's like that would intimidate. That intimidates me more than like a big guy yelling at me. Mm -hmm. That's more intimidating. Wow. A little tiny pageant girl. Because the judgmental nature of it all. Yes. Okay. Um, and just like your peers too, mm -hmm. I think, and. That's such a like subjective experience to be through, and like you're always like you're you're changing yourself. Like it's it's you as a person. You're sure. kind of like getting judged on and then critiquing yourself a lot. So yeah, I think it also, but it has helped me and prepared me for. It wasn't the first time me being on TV. It was not the first time I had had like people say mean things about the way I looked or about me as a person. Like. I was kind of, there were moments where it didn't get to me at all. Some moments it definitely did, like certain things were true. Why certain things did and certain things didn't? I think things that question like my character, mm. um, both from like mistakes that I've made and through um, just people like being misunderstood and being on this now like more public space, that the ones that question like m me as a person, like character was really hard Sure, because. Cause you want to speak back to those people and you can't, but it's, what does it do? And the more you do, the more it makes it a bigger problem. Yeah. And like I made, I, truly I've made all my worst mistakes for everyone to see. So like now I'm just kind of like an open book. I'm like, I've, I've made mistakes. I've, I've grown, I've changed, but that's also really hard when like the, the worst of yourself is being criticized. Sure. There's not like, I truly have nothing that like, it's like in the closet. Um, so that makes it really difficult. Mm -hmm. And, um, I've gone through a lot of like shame cycle stuff. Like we've, we've worked, I've worked on that a lot, but it makes it really hard to have people say things about you. And then, start questioning like I know that's not true but people think see, think that's me and then it's it's hard to like get out of that loop mm -hmm. it's it's a vicious circle and cycle um being in social media I see it happening to myself to my friends that are in the space uh, I've dated people in the pageant world and I've seen the toxicity that comes with it like I didn't know because I was a doctor at the time and not really mm -hmm. big on social media and I would see it and I would just be mind blown that this is happening behind the scenes. Whereas for the general public, you just feel like, oh, it's like flowery and beautiful, but it's nothing at all like that when you're on the inside. Oh my God. It's the most scandalous thing I've ever <laughs> experienced. I mean, there's some great, like there's some great things. I think, I don't think it's all bad or good. Sure. But I mean, some of the things that I was like, that was just said to me now that I'm like, older i'm like i cannot believe in the pageant world yes like what what was said i remember i had one director of a pageant like for me to go on and compete at the state level um sent me a picture of another girl on email and said you need to look like this by march and i was already doing like everything i've always like had struggle with like I've never been like overweight, but losing weight has always been like a real challenge for me mm -hmm. to where like 
I'll eat nothing and it's still like, how did you gain another pound? Like it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm learning, I'm trying to figure it out now. Sure. Um, and that was just really hard because I would be like, I'm trying so hard. And then having somebody like still like critique or I, I had, I remember this like old man that did like was in the pageant scene would be like, yeah, you still need to work on that, th that butt in the back of your thighs. Like I'm like just having a regular conversation and then they're like hard or yeah, like you're so, pr yeah, like you're so pretty. But if you just lose like 15 pounds, like you definitely, like you had, you have this and it's like, geez. So those things are really hard. And then of course, like, honestly, mostly it's just about your looks. I had um, one, one guy tell me, which I ended up, I don't really talk about this. I don't know why I'm telling everything. I have gotten like Botox in my forehead before, but it, it's because I had a, um, pageant director at age like 21, 22, tell me that my face looked like a bulldog when I talked. <laughs> oh so I needed to God. get that And I'm fixed. sorry I'm laughing. This no, but just, it's kind of funny. I'm laughing at the ridiculousness of the statement. He was like, like when you get really animated, um, you get all these like, all these lines, you kind of look like a bulldog. So we're gonna have to get that fixed. And you're like, oh my God, actually I kind of do. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. yeah, like, so yeah, there's a lot of that. Well, anyone... I think in their right mind would see the, the traumatizing nature of that. Not only are you saying that to someone who's younger, so they're more likely to be traumatized by it, mm -hmm. but then you're also telling it to someone who's seeking approval and trying to open themselves up and be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And in their most vulnerable time, you're saying those things. Yeah. And you're supposed to be the trusted person that they come to, that you're supposed to come to for advice. Yeah. So it's like the worst of all worlds. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I don't think I would have been even on the show The Bachelor if I wasn't hadn't like won Miss Alabama USA. So it all kind of like worked out. Um, and I finally like accomplished that, that there was like that goal. And I actually had stopped competing because I realized like I can't do this anymore. Like just the constant never feeling like enough and kind of being told that too. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even just like a feeling. It was like, and it's not like they're telling you you're not enough because you're not trying hard enough or you're not practicing whatever thing that they want yes. you to do. It's arbitrary goals of numbers on a scale where like they want you to not eat, which is A, unhealthy on its own, and B, might not cause the weight loss you want because your body goes into like a starvation mode yeah. and actually turns off your metabolism. Yes. So it's like a fundamental misunderstanding of what you're trying to achieve. It's and then yo-yo like, diets. Yes. And I think that's the biggest thing in uh, pageants. It's like the yo-yo dieting is so, I mean, I feel like most girls, unless you were just like natural, like a little bit naturally thinner, I don't think, I don't I, I can't speak. But a lot of the people, it just, it was such a yo-yo diet and then that catches up with you. And of course. Um, but yeah, it, but I did win when I, I was my smallest, but I had stopped doing it and it was like, everything started to like, you know, like I just naturally, then I don't think I was as stressed because I wasn't having to compete for anything. Yeah. So like, I naturally just kind of like found my rhythm and then uh, I like had a breakup and I ended up, uh, signing up for the, the pageant two weeks before it happened. And that's when I won. Not the, not the times that I like spent all year. I, I, I won when I just like showed up and I was like, oh, I'm just gonna do this. It. Like didn't have anybody come in and try to fix me and tell me what I need to work on. And I, I think that's you. what, what I try time. to like tell girls, like there's all these people that have these opinions of you, but then I think it gets in your head and then you're trying to make yourself a different person. And when I was just myself, that's when you won. Yeah. Would you recommend against people entering pageants? I think it's really up to the individual girl. Um, I think for some people, it can be really great. And some experiences like are, can be really beneficial. Um, but just like when I finally found that time of like, I can't do this anymore. I think really... 
having that sense of like self is really important doing those type of competitions of like what what's affecting you what's not having somebody you can be really open about like mm -hmm. like having a support group around a you. support group yeah, yeah. And i think i did but i just didn't know how to Make access that yeah. yeah yeah that's tough because if you look at the current psych literature that exists even there's a great book called like the body keeps the score mm -hmm. these are like i know we talk about something called ACE, which are adverse childhood experiences, as being something for younger children. I mean, these can easily be categorized as traumatic experiences that then have physical manifestations later down the line with skin color changes and cold weather and not being able to walk up steps. So it's not out of the question that this is happening as a direct result of that. And I'm not, again, tying it together, but I'm and saying it's not out of the question. that's just a little of the trauma. Like, yeah. definitely, that's one thing finally going to a psychiatrist and like therapy made me not feel like so um not just like weak but like something was wrong with me it's like oh like this all makes sense makes sense yes like oh if all this happened to you when you were like six years old mm -hmm. and then you know some other thing like yeah like and you never speak of it ever yeah it's going, you're going to have to deal with it at some point. Sure, you're right. The amount of times the body keeps the score has been recommended to me by everyone. <laughs> I'm like, I know, I know I got to read it. Um, I mean, there's TED Talks on the subject that I'm yes. sure you can get Yeah, as much. But it's just funny because like literally like last week I told, I was like, I know I've got like, it <laughs> just keeps coming up. So, Well, it's a mistake I actually make quite often with patients when I'm trying to explain that what they're experiencing is normal. And I don't think that's the right word for it because when they come in with a problem, like let's say they get splotchy skin in certain temperatures and I assume or make the diagnosis that it's based on the mental health cause because we ruled everything else out. And I say, your mental health situation is based on something terrible that happened to you. Mm -hmm. Let's say last month, the parent died, a loved one died, and now you're grieving and you're going through a rough time. So your body's acting off. Mm -hmm. that's normal. Like, meaning not what's happening to you is okay, but things don't work well when there is a mental health trigger. Yes. And if you're having a mental health trigger to something appropriate, that's not a disorder. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that gets lost these days when we talk about mental health. And I see that a lot in adolescents that come to my practice that say they're depressed and I'll ask them what's going on. They're like, oh, my friend recently lost her life. And I'm like, you're sad, you're mm -hmm. grieving. Let's change the vocabulary around this because it sounds like you're saying to your brain that there's something wrong with you. But if I ask you, I just lost my mom and I'm sad, would you judge me for it? No, never. Of course you lost your mom, you should be sad. But why are you judging yourself? Because we hold ourselves to these ridiculous standards that are not normal. Yes. I, I actually recently was reading about like, because I've been diagnosed with anxiety, depression, PTSD, they're kind of like, and like ADD, it, what is it? Like the ADD, depression and anxiety kind of form that triangle. And like, if you've had some trauma in the past, it kind of, they kind of loop together. And I definitely talk about dealing with depression, but at the same time, I feel like, um, I don't want depression to like be like my label of like, Oh, I have depression. I was like, no, like sometimes like sad things happen in life or like there's like even this move um, for me from LA to Nashville, like it brings up emotions and that's okay. And normal to be like feeling a little anxious and a little sad when something new is happening. Yeah. And like, I'm aware of that now I think because I've gone to therapy and have these things, I can have a toolbox for how to deal with that. And a barometer, yes, a measuring of like, stick of when it's a problem. Yes, like I really had a, um, I actually like had like a series, not a actual depression episode that I was going through this past um, like winter. Mm -hmm. Like it just didn't, it kind of made sense, but it was just like it, there's a difference. Yeah, there's it, a difference between being sad. It became a disorder sad. because it started affecting your life in ways that you couldn't control. Yes. So once you lose the control and it starts impacting your daily life, we call it major life uh, um, duties, work, relationships, et cetera. Yes. That's one. Yeah. And and I I was really 
struggling, but now I'm like, I don't like to say like, oh, I have, I've dealt with depression, but I don't want to say like I'm depressed because I'm not depressed. Mm -hmm. Like I'm feeling awesome, Okay, but I know how to mitigate the feelings. Yes. Yeah. And, and that could only, that could only come with experience mm -hmm. and maybe some guidance as you have. Sounds like really good people around you. For sure. But I didn't have that before. Mm -hmm. So it's really nice. Um, well, it's great that you're advocating for it. For it's others. so important to yeah. me because um, being like in Alabama, I didn't know anybody that went to therapy. And like you went to therapy, like if something like, well, nobody, no, nobody went to therapy. And if you did, you didn't talk about it. Like I had one friend in college that like literally, I found out she was going to therapy, but she would drive an hour away to go to therapy. For confidential reasons? Yes. Okay. And it just still like really stigmatized. And so like now I just think it is, it just helped me so much and I don't want it to have this stigma that you have. And also that you, to go to therapy, like you don't have to be going through something. Like I think it's, I have a great relationship with my boyfriend. We still go to couples therapy to just like, it was important to me because I had my own issues with the relationships that like, I thought we needed to have somebody like talk with us, but mm -hmm. they're always like, y'all are awesome. Like they're like, you are, <laughs> you're our easiest like uh, couple to deal with or to listen to. Like y'all are so great. You know how to communicate, but it's also, we like love it. Well, it's a preventive thing. Yes. You're going to get ahead of problems. Yes. <laughs> and I think that's also important. Mm -hmm. And it's great that you found a partner who's capable and wants to do that. I see a lot of people who are resistant to doing that maybe from the stigma, maybe from the preconceived notions of what's going to happen. That's why a lot of like the intro to conversation to therapy, I try and do in my office mm -hmm. of just explaining what to expect, what cognitive behavioral therapy is, explaining the basics of how we can't really control our feelings, but we can control our thoughts and then thoughts can lead to feelings changing. That conversation alone really gives people a layer of control. And ultimately, I think that's what people want. Yeah. Like we want... we. In general, if you ask people, they want to be able to feel sad. They want to be able to feel happy. They want to feel the range of emotions, but they don't want to be in one place for too long and they want to have the control of when to move around in it. I Absolutely. Like, do you see, sorry, I'm asking you a question. This is but, great. Um, do you feel like you're, are you seeing a lot of like patients that you suggest that to like more so than before? Before? Like how often I think do you the, have to have that conversation? Yeah, I think what's interesting about family medicine is that a lot of people will come in with a physical ailment and we end up having a mental health discussion. Yeah. And that's something a lot of people don't expect. That's always happened. But I think specifically over the last three years, there's been a, a huge, huge spike in loneliness, disconnect. And despite us being digitally connected, we're somehow physically and socially disconnected. And as a result, a lot of that support structure that we discussed about using is not there for people. Mm -hmm. A lot of the coping mechanisms over the last three years had to shift for people. Even for myself, something that I used to rely on as a coping mechanism was looking forward towards the future. Uh, so I would be working in an ICU setting, working crazy hours for a given month, but it wouldn't affect me because mentally, because I would say, oh, I'm looking forward to the trip that I have planned two months from now or the lighter rotation I have coming up. And because of the pandemic creating so much uncertainty and the disconnect from the fun things to do, that my coping mechanism was taken away from me. Mm -hmm. And that happened to a lot of people leading to spike in mental health conditions, spike in substance abuse disorders. And what's interesting is the sexes experience um, those symptoms of depression differently. And there's some patterns that tend to emerge. And men oftentimes would not come in with the same symptoms that we describe classically in depression of not wanting to get out of bed, feeling lazy. Instead, they go opposite end of the spectrum and become hyper-masculinized. The toxic masculinity can come out, abuse, um, substance abuse, gambling, over focus on getting rich and therefore all the other relationships suffer. Yes. So all of this has changed in the last five years because of this unique, really worldwide phenomenon that we're seeing, whether it was lockdown related or pandemic related or losing loved ones related, but it's definitely been 
an epidemic of massive proportions. Yeah, it seems like, and that's why I love talking about it because, or I'm honored to like talk about my story because I think there are so many people out there that are struggling and, and could feel better, but don't know what to do. Exactly. Um, and social media ignites that fire. Oh man, especially man, for young girls. How do you feel being like, I have a real problem with social media. Like okay, I, it kind of like, um, and it's like my own thing I have to deal with, but I was not a social media person. Like truly don't know where my phone is. Most of the time it's always dead. Okay. So when you like, get your phone back because you don't have your phone on some of the shows and it's like oh we have two million followers like that was just like that just happened yeah and i'm like what do i do with this and at first like i probably like, didn't understand like magnitude well there was excitement probably as well it was just like whoa but then i was also like i don't even know how to use this so <laughs> it was funny but i think that's also was was the charm back then people were like oh like she's not trying to be like an influencer like mm -hmm. i don't know what i'm doing but now I struggle with posting sometimes because I've realized I don't want to, like, I, I don't know how to just say this, but, like, I see the loop of social media mm -hmm. and how it's, it can be harmful, and I don't want to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. What's the loop? Can you describe to us the loop? I feel like the loop is you get on social media because – you're trying to distract yourself, first of all. Mm -hmm. And you get on social media and you see the picture perfect. Vacation, couple, vacation, whatever. Yeah. Or Car, just pack. even, and then even for me, it's like, oh my gosh, they're making so much content. That content's so good. Feeling, and then feeling worse about yourself. And then getting sucked into the hole to where then you're not doing anything to better yourself. It's paralyzing. Yes. And then you just, so then you're- Then you want to get distracted from that so yes. feeling and you start doing it again. And I don't want to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. And I also don't want to like fall victim to that. And it's so easy. And so I'm really trying, I, and I, I've also put limits on myself because I also think it can be really harsh. And like, I definitely have boundaries for myself. But sometimes I find myself not posting because I just like, I don't know. It just doesn't always feel good to do uh, it. Don't you feel over the last year, social media has become more transparent? Like before it was like when Instagram first started up, let's say five years ago, people would be just posting picturesque, perfect, hyper edited photos. Mm -hmm. And that still exists. Obviously there's a world for it. The filters are there, but now there's certain people going viral for just being themselves and like owning themselves. Yeah. And that's kind of new. I like that. Yeah. And I, I think it's um, awesome. I think for me, I just don't know how to not keep up, but it's not something I'm like super passionate about. Well, and that's okay. Like not yeah. everyone has to do. It's like saying you're not passionate about becoming a doctor. Okay. Yeah. Who's holding that against you? Yeah. <laughs> but I think there is still this like pressure because everybody knew like everything in my life. I, I, and I think I'm, I've worked on it, like putting limitations and boundaries of like what I share and what I don't. But it's also such a tool for whatever else you want to do in your life. So like I'm trying to find that balance. But then I also. Like, okay, are you a good video editor? Like, no. Do you judge yourself for not being a very good at video editor? No, I just hire someone to do it. So why are you not treating social media the same way? Yeah. Well, no, I'm asking. Because honestly, I think authenticity is like so key and nobody can run my social media better than I can sometimes. Does that make sense? I think if I had somebody that like helped me a little bit, but I could still, that I had a good rapport with and I could be myself, mm -hmm. I need to find that. Sure. That can help with like, I don't, video editing will take me all day. <laughs> and it it sucks the joy out of it. Like I can make a really good video and be like, okay, this is this will be funny. Yeah. But then when I have to edit it, I'm like, I hated this. <laughs> exactly. Why did I just do this? And when you say like posting authentically and often is key, key for what? What is your measure of success or like what do you what do you want to gain from it? I think a community. Okay. So you enjoy having the community aspect. I enjoy having the community um, because I want 
to take them along on what I'm doing because they kind of grown up with, and there's people that have like kind of grown up with me uh, mm -hmm. and kind of the journey that I've been on. Yeah. Because I started out in reality TV yeah. and in a like dating, uh, trying to get married and or whatever. And like that obviously was not what's happened. And now I'm like in the first healthy relationship I've ever been in. And I think that that's really cool for people to see my journey and like even just relationships, mental health, um, body image, so many things. And I, I want to be able to continue to do that. So I think social media is a great place to do that. But I also struggle with it. Yeah, a good um, potential strategy here is just to, in trying to accomplish what you want, all those goals, the solution might be to forget about that when you post and just post whatever without any concern of how it lands. Yeah. Because then you'll check all those boxes by not doing anything. And just, yeah. oh, this is what I'm up to. And yeah, I go through stages where I can do that. But like I said, I don't know where my, if I'm just being myself, <laughs> sure. I don't know where my phone is and it's probably dead. Yeah. That's how I could, I could live with a flip phone for sure. Wow. Do you think you could? Not with my current world that I'm in. Yeah. Business wise, because I, I'm big into the analytics of it all. And you know, like that, that's my life now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I don't get paid as a doctor anymore, basically. So this is just your full time. Yeah, this is my thing. But do you like that part? Uh, the doctor part? No. The social media part? Yeah. Well, yeah, because my like, so I don't have a parasocial relationship with my f viewers. Mm -hmm. um, I make educational content. They want to watch that content. They don't really care about me. They like that I'm presenting it. They like the accuracy of it. They trust that, but they're really watching for the content. And because of that, it takes some of the pressure off of me of needing to perform. Because initially I went viral or became popular for me, and that was really problematic. And I also had to face some of the same obstacles yeah. that you did. So luckily that's changed for me. And now it's about the information and putting out a good message and figuring out how to get the algorithm to share it. And it's become more fun because of it yeah. being that way. I think that's what I'm trying to shift more towards um, but it's, it's a hard thing to get yeah, out it's a of. Pivot, yeah. yeah. Um, but I've kind of separated myself from, and not like in a, oh, I'm better, but just like for my own mental health and where I want yeah, to continue to go. Purposes. Yeah. And, um, trying to figure out how to show up in the way that, that I want to and using social media as like a good, good thing. Yeah. Well, I see how you're showing up. You somehow ended up in the top four with a world champion soccer player, a Hall of Fame, um, not a Hall of Fame, a Super Bowl winning NFL player, and an all-star basketball player, and, and Hannah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> I don't know, but. You're like Dwight Howard who? No. <laughs> no, I remember like showing up being like, oh, great. I called my boyfriend after, uh, like we, we met everyone and I called him and he, he was like, oh shoot. Like there's like legit people, like athletes. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, well, just do the best you can. Because <laughs> and then you're at, like, I'm winning this. Yeah. But at first, like he was like, everyone of my friends that know me, when I would tell them I'm doing the show, they're like, oh, you're going to crush it. I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, oh yeah, you'll probably freaking win. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like no. And then he, I told him, and he was like, "Oh wow, that's that's like hard competition, even though it's not even like a competition with other people." But you, with, it's hard not to like view yourself, of course, like the Wyatt Howard, and then freaking Carly Lloyd's beside you, and I'm like, I, I uh, can jump rope. I don't know, <laughs> not even good. What like physically nowhere compared. But I think what my friends and family like seeing me that I, I learned about myself through the show is I'm just like really resilient and have like a lot of grit. You're a survivor. I'm a survivor. Yeah. Yeah. And um, all the things that have happened to me, for me, that I've done, like it's all like made me into this person who like when 
I do hit rock bottom when shit hits the fan, when I go through something unexpected, I somehow can like get back up. It may take me longer sometimes than others and I have to make space and give myself a way to to move on and, and move forward, but I can do it. And that that is something that I'm proud of now. For sure. And yeah. it's something to be proud of. Yeah. But speaking of shit hitting the fan and speaking of Carly, I heard you had a magical potion that you and Carly were basically on performance enhancing drugs on the show. Oh, tell us my about gosh. That. Yes. So people listening are probably like, what? What are you? No, no. Uh, <laughs> so the uh, living situation uh, during special forces was horrible. It was. And the food I heard was delicious. The food was terrible. <laughs> we slept on like a cot, like, you like even I could barely fit on. So like I, Dwight, I, he was just. I feel so bad for him. It was so small. Our floor, the floor is this Jordanian desert sand. Um, but the bathrooms were buckets with a piece of like plywood <laughs> that went up to like your shoulder, so you could see like from the top up and like right beside each other. And I already do y'all talk like open about like I have already like really bad IBS constipation mm -hmm. have my whole life. Um, I could tell you about that too. Maybe this all connects, but um, really struggled with that. Uh, on the show. On the, always, always, but on the show, like I've been put hospitalized because of this before. So this mm -hmm. is not like a new thing, but it kind of like gets serious only sometimes. And on the show, I did, could not go to the bathroom for like seven days and hadn't gone even before that. So it was like a long time and I was starting to like feel it. It's yeah. very uncomfortable. And the medic was like, you're, you have to go to the restroom. <laughs> and I'm like, you have. it's, it's so hard because first of all, I would w want to try, but there are, and I'm not exaggerating, like 50 flies in the toilet that are on your private parts on your butt and you're trying to use the restroom and it's impossible. So then like, that's I not bet when you were winning your pageant, you did not think about this being a possibility in your future. No, never. Um, and so he was like, you have to start using the restroom. So like he was giving me, he first started off like giving me some like pills, like stuff to take. And then the thing that finally worked was this like syrup stuff. And I finally went and like, we were, we're all so close at this point. Like it was celebrated. Like it was, <laughs> I, I was scared. Like when the show came out. Was that like, your happiest poop ever? Um, well, no, I've been more constipated. Oh, so, okay. But it, in the desert. In the I desert, mean, yeah. it was really nice. Um, but like, I was so scared when the show came out. I'm like, they're going to make like my story. My story is going to be about me shitting <laughs> it was that much of like an, a, a thing that was talked about i'm like this is gonna be like what they show they didn't but um yeah it was a whole thing we had me and carly had a lot of the same we had that issue we had really bad um athletes feet foot mm -hmm. i don't know what you call it but um like my feet shed for like two weeks wow it was horrible um yeah victory yeah i mean that's you you've overcome a lot have. And I don't mean in life. I just mean in the <laughs> show. Just on the show. In yeah. life as well. Yeah. Um, okay. So are you ready to play the lightning round, which in our term here is called checking your reflexes? Okay. Sure. Okay. It's going to be really serious. Okay. And ask you questions and you have to be, first of all, do you think they should, uh, who do you think would have won me or Dr. Drew if I was on the show with you guys? If it was like doctor versus doctor. Oh my gosh. You got to be the next doctor that's on there. I know. Uh, they've, there's been conversations about the bachelor thing. I'm like, I don't think that's for me, but that I would do. Yes. You should totally do this. This is, yeah. you got to do it. I would do it. I think I would do. Okay. You, it's just, maybe awesome. people can vote. Can they vote me in like the opposite of survivor? No, we don't get no voting. Oh, I, but that's good. I, did you, did someone recommend you for this? I don't know how, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, well, it's cause you're a winner in the dancing thing. So. With the stars. Probably they just wanted somebody from a big franchise. I mean. Makes sense. That makes sense. But. 
Well, if they need another doctor, I think they, they need know another where to doctor. Look. All right. First question. Okay. Healthiest part of your body is? Mm, oh, gosh, that's hard. <laughs> You're like, there's not many. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, I'm like, oh, uh, no. What is healthy? My my eyes. Okay, good vision. Got good vision. No contacts. <laughs> no, but I just went to the doctor to help with my vision a little bit. But it's still like I have 21, 20, 20 vision. It's more just a astigmatism. I have that too. Yeah, but okay. that's the close. That's the best thing. Okay, great. <laughs> Everything else has issues. One part of your body that you wish you could replace. Um, oh, my wrist. Why? Carpal tunnel? Um, no, because I've broken them five times. Oh, so you just want like a new one from scratch? Just a new one. Okay. Yeah. That's fair. Uh, falling on an outstretched hand, I'm assuming? Yes. Skiing? No, when I was little, I went to the circus and then tried to be an acrobat and oh. it's a whole thing. That'll do it. Yeah. What's one thing that raised your blood pressure this week? I think maybe uh, we almost didn't get the house that we wanted in Nashville and I was getting stressed because like we move in like a f not that long and that just stressed me out. But then we did get it. So it was fine. Wow. Okay. Isn't that funny? We're kind of going through the same process oh, okay, here. Cool. Um, Dwight Howard asked you this question, but I'm going to ask you again because it sounds like you may have a change of heart. Would you rather go to jail for 10 days or do the special forces again? I think I'd rather go to jail. I still think that. Okay. Wow. No, not rather. Not rather. I think, well. Wait, do you want to go to jail or do you want to do special forces again? I like think jail right would now, be. What's easier? I think jail would be easier. So special forces harder. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. Although I guess it depends which jail. I know. But that's also <laughs> the thing. It's like, am I going to be at one where they like. Maximum security. Not. Yeah. I want to go to like, like, uh. A nice jail. Okay. Which <laughs> I want to go to nice the, jail. The judge usually asks you that question. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to go to a nice jail? Um, have you ever almost died? Yes. You want to tell us how? Um, yeah. I, well, on the show, I almost died. Um, but I had a, I could have died. I had a tumor on my pancreas when I was young. As a child, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that was really scary. And it all happened really fast. And like it was malignant, but in case, and it was able like to get like it all out. And yeah. But that was a really scary. scary. And I, it was very obvious. Like I was getting sick. Like my mom was like, there's something wrong. So it all kind of started like attacking or whatever really quickly and mm. got super sick. It's actually like all in the, all the IBS stuff started happening. Mm. Um, and then I was having some weird, like I started my period, but then I never did again, but it was all during this time I was having like all these issues. But because of that, they did an MRI and then they saw. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so it, incidentally, they found it out. all incidentally happened, but I was having all these issues. So I was sick. So yeah, that was probably like the, the closest. closest of like, oh, like she's really sick. And then I can't tell on the show thing because legally. What do you mean? Of course you can. No. Yeah. This is a safe space. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's just, I mean, you're, you're put in like crazy situations. And so everything needs to go like correctly. Oh, okay. Got it. But I was fine. Okay. I'm good. I'm here. That's why it's the last question because we're so happy you're here and that you're continuing to crush in every competition series you've ever been put in. I know. I think I need to stop now though. No, like, I, I, I have a good track. Dominating. I have a good track record. Don't stop winning. So, but that's the thing. I don't, I just want to say on survivor. my track record. I'm confident in you. If I was a betting man, I'm putting it on you. Well, thanks. Where can people go to learn more about what you're up to? Where do you want them to follow you? Instagram is probably the best place. It's the place that I'm like most likely going to show up on, you know, once. If the phone ever gets charged weeks. and yeah. found. <laughs> I'm there. Awesome. Um, yeah, but that's where I like update everybody on my life, show my dog. He's really freaking cute. So you'll get more Wally updates maybe than Hannah updates, but they're great. That's amazing. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for coming on the checkup. This was so great. Yay. Thank you. Awesome. I'm smitten.
You are? Are you as smitten as I am? She's... I don't know what the word smitten means. Just like, oh, she's a radiant, The positive energy is, is palpable. Mm-hmm. So we needed that because we've been working a lot, <laughs> um, getting punched in the face in boxing. You need some positive energy. Yeah. You know, being from California and then Chicago and now New York, I haven't encountered many like Southern people. Yeah. They carry a different... They do. Vibe. And you know what's interesting I noticed uh, about Hannah is when she would speak about really dark moments, she smiled a lot. Mm-hmm. And that could be like two things. It could be one, her using that as kind of not wanting to feel the negative emotions. But at the same time, it could be that she's making so much progress that she's like laughing at how evil these people were and how ridiculous it was. So I'm really hoping it's the latter. She has, she has a smile so magnificent, you make her the bachelorette. Like that's how, <laughs> yeah, how big and beautiful yeah. her her, her yeah, smile was. Makes sense. And we why have, she's winning every reality TV show. I st- I still don't think we've uncovered it. Like yeah. it's it is statistically unusual how successful she has been on reality television, not just from a casting perspective, but from a victory perspective. I should box her. She'd probably find a way she'd disassociate and she'd get in there. <laughs> I dissociated too against Chris and it didn't work out well. She'd for eat me. punches like I dubs and then uh, outlast you. And how weird is it that she's buying a house? I'm trying to buy a house. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of scary to talk about, but maybe New York City is not going to be my technical forever home. This is, made, depending on when you're hearing this, might be breaking news. Yeah. Dr. Mike leaving the Big Apple? Is yeah. this true? Not far, 30 minutes away, but okay. a big yard for Bear to roam, uh, more studio space for us to film, um, and close enough to the city where we can still do stuff and um, have a space for the podcast in the city as well. So... I'm trying to make it all happen, but as you know, lots of steps, making an offer was accepted, then inspection, septic system, well testing, house roof testing, leak testing, pool testing. That's right, there's a pool. Mm-hmm. Pool videos? Pool? Sauna? S- benefits? Swimming, how I swim with my Newfoundland bear? Oh, bear swims. <laughs> but yeah, it's going to be good times if it does happen. Keep you guys abreast. Sam, hit me with a medical question. I have a medical question for you. From? I need the username because these usernames have been on point. This is another one. This is a question from Sand King. Okay. (laughs) Does he have a sandy crown? I can't answer that. Um, But what I do know is that Sand King wants to know whether or not he or she should be worried about microplastics. They're oh. hearing a lot of stuff in the news about microplastics. He uh, wants to know, should I, I keep food in plastic bags and plastic containers? Is this something that uh, people need to worry about? Honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> but there are a few things that are good to have as best practices. Number one, not reusing. Well, non-re- first of all, what is a microplastic? That's a great question for potentially Hannah Fry or <laughs> okay. Dr. Andrea Love. Presumably a very, Jessica very, Simon. very small piece of plastic, right? That's what the words literally mean. Yes. Again, not my field of expertise. And I would need to spend more time digging into it. But basically the idea is that m- micro particles of the plastic can seep into certain liquids or foods and then enter your body causing dysfunction. And a lot of it is fear mongering based, but then there's some reality to it. Um, bigger picture, it definitely needs to be investigated. Practical things, here's what I would tell my patients if I was giving some advice. Number one, don't use non-reusable water bottles. Like don't take a spring water bottle and refill it over and over again Mm -hmm. because that's not what it's made for. Mm -hmm. Uh, Get one that is BPA free. That is like kind of the label you look for. Um, Don't heat things up in plastic, non-microwavable safe containers because that could also cause a problem. Um, And then in general, try and limit waste. I know I'm like probably the last person that should be saying that because I'm make a lot of waste in my house, but it's something I want to improve upon. Okay. Sand King, I hope you found that valuable. What I find valuable is Sand King living a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Yes, we need more five-star reviews because that is how podcasts spread, especially in the audio podcast world. Mm-hmm. You know, In the video podcast world, you get to enjoy the visual of this checkup podcast, 
But on audio, you just got to give us five stars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll appreciate it a lot. But in the body of that five-star review, ask questions in addition to telling us how you feel. Leave names of guests that you want us to interview because mm. that list is ever growing and we already have some cool ones filmed and ready to And because go. we've had so many great guests so far, it makes it easier for us to get even bigger and yes, better guests. exactly. Oh, you know what's also I thought worth mentioning? If you've made it this far, perhaps you might be interested in joining us on Patreon. Yes. We have an exclusive Patreon community. With it's, a Discord. With, uh, with a Discord and server. And monthly live stream. And monthly live streams. We get to see and play with Bear. That's right. With uh, Mike on camera, me off camera, and Bear hangs out there. And we raise uh, money for charity. Every, it's $10 a month. And 100% of the proceeds get donated to a charity of your choice. So every month I go through the Discord server where we have a charity section and people nominate charities. We whittle those charities down and everyone gets to vote. And then we always donate that money. We've donated a, a little over $150,000 over yeah. the years now. Be a part of it. Mm -hmm. So if, if you made it this far and you're enjoying the conversation, maybe you'd enjoy hanging get out with cool us Get some cool merch there. like I have here that I've on. I have the chest compression shirt. Mm -hmm. Sam has the organ shirt. I do. That's it. Take a And um, I actually just gave Hannah Brown her own chest compression shirt. That's yes, exciting. and if you're a part of the Patreon, you get uh, early access to merch drops. Mm. That's one of the uh, That's, one of the perks. Yeah, we've also. and ten percent off. I and uh, discounts, yeah, depending on what promo we've got going on. So lots of uh, perks in there. So hopefully, we'll be seeing you in the Patreon. Exactly. And if you do join the Patreon, or if you don't join the Patreon, check out this video of the worst skincare mistakes that my patients make. Definitely worth watching. And as always, stay happy and healthy. Thanks for listening and watching the Checkup Podcast. Bye.